Hi everyone, and welcome to this Warp Core technical breakdown. Everything you see in this scene is being rendered in real time in a web browser, from the simple grid pattern to the dynamic lighting and falling embers. We've been working on Warp Core, the new rendering engine for Albert Rodeo, for quite a while now, and in this video we're going to go behind the scenes to see how it works. There's a lot that goes into ensuring something like this can run at 60 frames per second across desktop and mobile, so let's wind back the clock a little and build everything up one cell at a time. We want our canvas to be infinitely big, but before that we should probably make sure it is at least finitely big, so let's draw a couple of grid cells. Here's a few hexagons arranged in a neat pattern. We'll also add some dashes and dots to spice things up and make it look nicer. Once we're happy with our grid pattern, we'll take a snapshot and use the GPU to tile it as many times as we need. This way we only need to render a few cells in order to fill our entire scene with a grid. Now let's draw a happy little hexagon here to fill one of our grid cells. But something isn't quite right, it may be hard to see here, but if we zoom out to show another hexagon, hopefully it will be a bit more obvious. This bottom hexagon is exactly 10 grid cells below the first, but the grid behind it doesn't match up. This is because the pattern we started with needs to use whole numbers of pixels for its width and height. But one tricky thing about hexagons is their size isn't defined by whole numbers. So, in order to fix this, we will reshape the grid after it's finished drawing to account for this drift. With this, we're able to draw grids of many shapes and styles over an infinitely large area, and we only ever have to render a small number of grid cells to do it. There really is a beauty in hexagons, isn't there? Let's zoom back in and look at how we can fill this grid with lots of characters. First, let's add this friendly little dragon. This asset is a WebM video from Crosshead Studios, whose link is in the description. WebM is a great format because it has a small file size and supports transparency, so we can get those lovely cutouts around the wings. However, adding video like this could potentially lead to some performance issues if we aren't careful. To demonstrate this, let's give them a few friends. That's better. Since all three dragons look the same, we can extract all their shared properties into a single container that each of them will share. In this case, it will include the video asset and player, but also any other material properties like the paint asset used to render the dragon at different opacities. In programming, this process of extracting out large common properties from assets is called the flyweight pattern and is really useful for us to keep memory usage low. We can demonstrate this by showing our RAM usage with three dragons, which hovers at around 125 megabytes on CPU, as seen in the middle column, and 64 megabytes on the GPU, as seen in the right column. Now, as we add over 150 extra dragons to our canvas, we can see our CPU memory increase to around 130 megabytes while the GPU stays at the baseline of 64 megabytes. But if we wanted the party to get even bigger, we might run into some issues. While our RAM usage is under control, our CPU usage could use some work. The first thing to notice is that even though we only see 45 dragons on screen at the moment, we're still trying to draw all 150 that we added just before. To fix this, we'll add a spatial index to our scene. This works by adding all our dragons to a tree of bounding boxes, which we can query efficiently. Then, when we want to draw our scene, we can use that tree to find all the items that the user can see, and skip any items that would be outside of their viewport. With this, we can now support larger scenes with more and more dragons. However, not all scenes have thousands of dragons in them, sometimes we just need to display a single really large map. In this scene, we have the Hellfire Prison map by Chepeku, which you can find in the Starter Sets tab inside of Albert Rodeo. At almost 7,000 pixels wide and over 11,000 pixels tall, this map is extremely detailed, and most of the time when running this map we'll be zoomed in to only see a few rooms at a time. However, because the map is a single asset, even if we're only looking at a small part of it, we still have to pay the cost of processing the whole thing. Also, our spatial index that we set up in the previous part won't be able to help here, because in this case there is a single very large image rather than lots of smaller ones. To demonstrate this, the part labelled Viewport shows what the user is actually seeing, while the area labelled Overdraw shows what we are processing. The GPU will perform clipping, so we don't have to fully render every pixel of the image outside the viewport, but we still have to pay the cost of loading that very large image, even though we're only looking at a small part of it. To speed things up, we want to minimise this overdraw. The first step will be to split this map into a whole bunch of tiles. Each tile will be a fixed size, and we'll be able to select any tile we need and only draw that small portion of the image. For Warp Core, this tiling work is also done on the server, to prevent the browser from having to do all that processing. So, now if we only render the tiles that are seen by the viewport, we can significantly reduce this overdraw. 
As you can see, overdraw will only occur when our tiles and viewport overlap, and even then, it's only partial. However, not everything is perfect. If the user zooms out to show the entire map, they can now see every tile. And while there is no overdraw because we're looking at the entire image, there are still some problems, mainly with performance. In this case, we're using a 1080p display, which has a resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels, but our image has a resolution of almost 7000 by 11000 pixels. That means for every pixel in our viewport, there are 100 pixels in the image. This leads to bad cache performance on the GPU, and while doing this might work for one big map, Albert Rodeo supports putting many maps side by side, so we need to find something more efficient. To fix this, we'll also generate many different versions of our map at increasingly smaller resolutions, each of which will also be tiled. And now, when you zoom out, not only will we pick the tiles that should be displayed, we will also find the best resolution to minimise having to render pixels that wouldn't be seen anyway. So, in this case when zoomed in, we are only drawing 12 tiles, and now, when zoomed out, we are only drawing 6 tiles, instead of over 100 tiles that we would have been drawing prior to having those different resolution images. This is similar to a technology called Streaming Virtual Texturing, used in game engines like Unreal Engine 5, allowing us to support extremely detailed maps across both desktop and mobile. Let's zoom back into our map and look at something much more atmospheric. Hiding areas from your players is an important part of any virtual tabletop. To do this, Albert Rodeo has a range of options for static and dynamic fog shapes. Static fog shapes are the simplest, so let's start with them. First, let's obscure things by filling the scene with fog. Here, we're the GM, so for us the fog layer desaturates what's hidden and colorizes the visible areas. This makes it easy to see which parts are covered in fog and hidden from our players. Now we can use the fog tool to cut out a room that the players will be able to see. Let's also add a little barbarian token. Now we can continue using the fog tool to cut out more rooms, and as the players move through the dungeon, I can reveal each room one at a time. As this is the simplest fog method, this is what we ship out of the box. But just as you can add more and more fancy setups when playing in person, you can also extend Albert Rodeo to do a bunch more. For example, say your players have found the diagram for a secret summoning ritual and are entering the dungeon where it is about to take place. Instead of having a simple dark shape for the fog layer, we can actually use the diagram the players found as an overlay. Here it is in action. Using the outliner extension, the ritual is placed on the fog layer and as with the GM, we can see both the ritual and the underlying map. But if we switch to the player view, we can see the dungeon's details showing through only in the places that the players have already visited. We can do this because fog isn't limited just to vector shapes and is actually drawn on a separate layer and composited into the scene. As a result of this independent fog layer, we can also use the dynamic fog extension, which allows you to treat your fog shapes as walls. Then you can add lights to the characters so that when they move, the fog is automatically cut away. This dynamic lighting is calculated on the GPU and allows for nice soft edges, which you can see as it slowly fades into the distance. To make things a bit spookier, we can also limit the angle of our light so our barbarian friend can only see what's in front of him. And if we really want to ratchet up the tension, we can narrow the inner angle of the light to blur the edges of the revealed area. All right, that might be a bit too much tension, so let's brighten things up again. Our map is looking a little static, so next, let's heat things up with some post-processing effects. Here's a nice fire layer created with a new weather extension. These embers are all procedurally generated on the GPU, which allows us to do some really cool things, like control the wind's direction and speed and the density of the embers in real time. This isn't something you'd be able to do with a simple looping video that's overlaid on top of the scene. To finish off this scene, let's add our dragon back in, but this time he's looking a little less friendly. And now we're finally ready to run our big boss encounter. Everything that has been shown in this video was animated in the Warp Core engine in real time, so if you too would like to check out our new rendering engine, make sure to head over to albear.rodeo. Also, this video was a little different than our usual tutorial content, so if you'd like to see more of these tech breakdown videos, let us know in the comments.